Bibles, turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 16. In 1989, my father-in-law was diagnosed with liver cancer. He went through the regiment that it seems like most all cancer patients go through. There was the chemotherapy, there was the radiation, there was the surgery, and all this time he was steadily getting weaker and weaker. Finally, after two years of this regiment, the doctor said, we can do no more, and they sent him home to die. For ten more months, we saw him rapidly deteriorate. The last couple of months, the pain was almost constant and almost unbearable. He did become a Christian during this process. I was visiting with him three days before he died. He said to me, you know, I want to die. He said, I'm tired of the suffering and the pain. He says, when I wake up in the morning and, I, and I'm still alive, it's like I missed the bus. He said, why doesn't God just go ahead and take me? Why am I having to stay here and suffer so much? That's the question that all of us have asked in our times of adversity and hardship, isn't it? Lord, why? Lord, why am I having to go through this? Lord, why is my loved one having to experience such suffering? We've studied about God's providence. We know He works all things after the counsel of His will. We've looked at God's steadfast covenant love. So we know God is loving. We know God is powerful. Then why does God allow us to undergo such suffering and pain? Why such adversity? I want to answer that question for you this morning. And let me say, if you will receive this truth this morning, it will save you countless hours of frustration and anger and anxiety throughout the rest of your life. And the answer to the question why is found in God's character. It's found in the wisdom of God. We've been studying knowing God. We're seeking to know and understand our God in deeper ways. We've looked at His steadfast covenant love. Last week we also looked at our Lord and we looked at an aspect of His blessedness toward us. And today we're going to look at yet another. We're going to add to that providential care of God His wisdom. Stand in respect for the Word of God as I read verses 25 through 27 of Romans chapter 16. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God. Through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Paul says to the only, you may be seated, to the only wise God. What is wisdom? Wisdom practically can be defined as knowing the best way to accomplish your goal. Now, if I wanted to build a house, I would have to make some decisions about building that house. Would I choose to do the work myself? Would I choose to be the general contractor and get subcontractors to come in and do the work and me supervise it? Or would I get a general contractor and turn it all over to him? Now for me, wisdom would not be for me to build it. Wisdom would not be for me to be the general contractor. 
Wisdom for me would be to have a general contract to take over because I don't know anything about building houses. Now, if it was somebody else, like Filiberto, wisdom might be for him to build his own house. For you, it might be a different way. But wisdom would be for you to choose the best way to accomplish your goal. You remember Solomon? King Solomon called the wisest man in the world. You remember that two prostitutes came to him one day and and one was holding a baby and, and said, this is my baby, and the other one said, no, that baby is mine. What had happened is they were both living in the same house. They both had a young baby, and during the night, one of the ladies, or one of the women, rolled over and killed her baby, so she went and took her dead baby and placed it in the bed with the other lady, took her live baby and took it into her bed. When the lady woke up and looked over and saw the dead baby, she looked close and realized it wasn't her. So they went before King Solomon. Well, she said, she said, right? How do you determine? What did Solomon do? You know the story. He said, bring me a sword. We're to divide the baby in half. Both of you can have half of it. The true mother said, no, don't do that. Give it to her. The one who was not true mother said, yeah, do that. Cut it in half. Now, wisdom is determining the best way to accomplish the goal. God's wisdom means that God determines the best way to accomplish his goal. Since God is all-knowing, he always knows the best way to accomplish his will. Since God is all-powerful, he is able to do the best way to accomplish his will. And so God's wisdom is God always choosing the best way to accomplish his will in our lives. You might be thinking, well, preacher, what does that have to do with the adversity and suffering in my life? It has everything to do with it. Because God's wisdom means God will always choose the best way to accomplish His will in your life. Well, what is His will in your life? Well, James tells us over in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Listen. Listen. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete. And that word perfect means mature, reaching the desired goal, lacking in nothing. Now James is talking about spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity can be simply defined as Christ-likeness. The more you and I are like Jesus in our lives, the more spiritually mature we are, right? So God's will for me is for me to become like Jesus. God's will for you as a Christian is for you to become like Jesus. But you and I are different. And so God's not into mass production. He is not into using a cookie-cutter approach. So you see, just like in building that house, each of us would go about doing it a different way if we had wisdom. When it comes to making you like Jesus, God's going to do it differently than He would do it in my life because I'm different than you are. But what I know is, because God is all wise... And wisdom is always choosing the best way to accomplish your goal. I know for certain that the way God is going to work in my life to make me like Jesus is the best way. That tells me that the adversities, the difficulties, the hardships that you and I go through, listen now, are tailor-made for you. Tailor-made because they are the best way to make you like Jesus. Have you ever wondered why certain people seem to go through so much hardship? Seem to go through so much suffering? Maybe you think you have gone through a lot of suffering. Say, God, why am I going through all this suffering? What's the answer to the question of why? Because that suffering you're going through is God's best way to make you like Jesus. You hear that? It's God's way to make you like Jesus. You've all heard the illustration 
of the guy, the boy going up to the, the sculpture, and he says, how do you take that block of stone and sculpture that beautiful figure? And the man said, I just chip away everything that doesn't look like what I'm seeking to make. What God's doing in your life is He's taking that block of, of sinful humanity called self, and He's chipping away at everything in your life that doesn't look like who? Jesus. Right? He's making you like Jesus. And some of us are hard. Some of us are hard, granted. And it takes some pretty hard licks to knock off some of those edges. That selfishness. That envy. That pride. That fear. That worry. Whatever it might be. And so the answer to the question, Why, Lord? is because this is God's best to make you like Jesus. God can look at you as a Christian and He can say to you, what I'm putting in your life today, that adversity, that difficulty, even when you, because of your stupid choices, get into the problem, I am using it to make you like Jesus. When I was sharing with my father-in-law on that day, I was talking to him before he died, asking, why do I have to go through such suffering? I share with him James 1.12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I said, God is allowing you to go through this suffering. He's waiting to take you until your faith has been tested and the perseverance has been shown to be there that He desires in your life. There's a reason behind it, is what I was telling Him. And that reason has to do with the perfecting of your faith before you die. God works to accomplish His will in our lives in the best way possible. Now I want to share with you some ways that God uses adversity to make us like Jesus. Okay? Let me just give you some reasons. You can hold on to these reasons as you're going through your adversity. First, God prunes us in our sufferings. Over in John chapter 15, Jesus was speaking, and He said, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it, so it might bear more fruit. Now, I'm trying to grow some, some grapes and, and some muscadines, and so I've been doing a little research on, on pruning grapes. Now, I didn't realize this till I did my research, but do you realize that the grapes only grow on the new growth? And so when you prune grapes every year, you will prune 90% of what's there. That's right. You will prune it back so that the new growth will come out and the energy won't be wasted on old growth. That tells me when God prunes us, He prunes us so the spiritual energies will be spent on what's true fruit and not on false old growth. You see, when you and I as Christians are growing, we tend to put our energies in things that are not truly spiritual. We tend to seek position and success and reputation rather than God's glory, don't we? We tend to rely on our own talents and our own abilities rather than relying on the power of Christ in us. We're so easily distracted by and pulled away by the things of this world, by the pleasures and possessions of this world. And so what God does, He comes in and He prunes us. He uses the adversity. He uses the difficulties to cut back and get our attention and help us realize, hey, we have gotten our priorities out of place. We need to reevaluate our lives. We need to realize, hey, I've been doing this in my own strength rather than trusting God to work in me. Right? I've been seeking my own glory here. That's why I got upset when somebody said something. If I were seeking God's glory, it wouldn't have made me near as upset, right? So God uses that to reveal to us the energies we're putting into the wrong 
direction. It's a man that had the serious heart attack and he almost died. But what he realized through that heart attack was he was spending way too much time at work. Nobody ever says on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at work. He realized his family should be his priority. And he rechanged his whole list of priorities because he had a near-death experience. And sometimes God has to, to bring us to that point that we reevaluate our lives. So God uses adversity to prune us. Secondly, God brings adversity so that He might bring about holiness in us. Now we've talked about positional holiness versus practical holiness. Positional holiness means that you and I as Christians are positioned in Christ and we are as holy as Christ is. That holiness is given to us in Christ. That's our positional holiness. Now our practical holiness is what we actually live out in this life. Now, you and I know there's a whole big difference between our practical holiness and our positional holiness, right? So God is in the process of wanting to bring our practical holiness, bring up our living to our position, that we might live out this holiness that God has given us in Jesus. Well, God uses adversity to do this. He does that because in adversity, He reveals the true corruption that is still within us. Truth is, we do not know ourselves or the remaining corruption that is within us. We have the tremendous ability to rationalize away every sin. You see, we think we're doing well. We think we're bearing the fruit of the Spirit. I think, man, I'm loving everybody. And then somebody hurts me deeply or hurts one of my family members, and boy, what I find coming up in my heart. Not love. Uh uh. Anger. Hate. Bitterness. I do not want to forgive them. I feel resentment surge within me toward them. It seems like all the spiritual growth I have has vanished. What's God doing? <laughs> He's showing me, buddy, that's still sin in your life. You're not nearly as far along as you thought you were. That corruption is still there. And I have to fall down on my knees and say, God, forgive me. Give me more love. Let your love flow through me. Forgive me for my spiritual pride at thinking I was further along than I am. So God uses the adversity to bring us into holiness. He says, for they discipline us for a short time as seems best to them. Our earthly parents do. But He, God, disciplines us for our good, so that we may share His, what? Holiness. God uses the adversity to bring us into deeper levels of practical holiness. Thirdly, God uses the adversity to show us our dependence on Him. We live in a world that worships independence and self-reliance. We hear that mantra spoken over and over again. Be all that you can be is the army motto. We need to realize that we're not self-sufficient, but we are Christ-sufficient. That we are not to be self-independent, but we are to be dependent on Christ. Look at what Paul says how God used adversity to teach him this in 2 Corinthians. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now this was some pretty tough adversity. Beyond his strength, it was excessive, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us 
He on whom we have set our hope. What's Paul saying? He said, man, God put us through the ringer. <laughs> he took us to the nth degree. He took us beyond our own strength. But why? So that we would learn that our sufficiency is not in ourselves but in Him. We would learn that we're dependent on Him. That's why God put you in that situation that you cannot in yourself handle. That's why He brings you to your limit. He pushes you beyond and you say, God, I, I can't do it. And He says, great, now look to me and I'll give you the grace you need to go through it. That's why he brings us to such extremity, extreme situations, beyond our strength, that we will depend on his strength. And then fourthly, God uses adversity to bring endurance within us. Again, the passage we saw earlier in James. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, not if, do not ever think the Christian life is free from suffering and trials and tribulations. The Scripture never teaches that. Paul says, through many tribulations you shall enter the kingdom of God. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Life is filled with troubles, but there's a reason for it, right? Because it's tailor-made, tailor-made for your situation. Because God knows what it takes to make you like Jesus. So when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. Stickability. You keep going even when you want to quit. Now how does a marathon runner build up endurance? Does he do it by running 100-yard sprints every day? No. He has to run those long distances. He has to run when he wants to quit. Now, I can even run a 100-yard dash. Now, not fast, but I can do it. So it doesn't take much endurance to run 100 yards. But now you're talking about 26 miles. They say there's that wall that they hit around mile marker 23. When everything within them wants to quit, but they have to keep going. They have to ignore the pain in their body that their body is screaming, stop, stop. But they have to keep going. They build up that endurance over time, running distances. Spiritual endurance is the same way. You don't build up spiritual endurance as running 100-yard sprints. You build up spiritual endurance as going through trials and hardships that last weeks and weeks and maybe months maybe even years, but you continue to hold on and trust God and look to God and depend on God to give you the strength to get through it. And all the time, your spiritual endurance is building stronger and stronger and stronger. And that results in you being perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, bringing you into Christ's likeness. And that hardship that you're going through that other people don't have to go through, it's because it's God's best for you. It's tailor-made for you. God will move heaven and earth to put that trial in your life. Now think about some of the things you've gone through and what had to happen for those things to happen in your life. And you'll see how serious God is about making you like Christ. So He'll use that to bring endurance within our lives. And number five, He prepares us for service through our adversities. 2 Corinthians 1.4 It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Why? So that we will be able to comfort others. Right? Who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted. What does that mean? That means God will take that tribulation, that hardship, that difficulty that you're going through, and He will abound His grace in your life and comfort you in that so that you will be able to comfort someone else that's going through the same thing by sharing with them what God did in your life. And so God is using you for greater service through your suffering. 
You see, it all progresses. Pruning, holiness, dependence, perseverance, service. See how it goes? Not only is God preparing you for service in this life, but now listen. God's preparing you for service in eternity. Don't think we're just going to sit around in eternity all day and do nothing. No, the Bible says that we will serve Him in heaven. I don't know exactly what that means, but it means you and I are going to be serving. I believe that God uses this life to get us prepared for the service He has for us in eternity. Now think back in the Old Testament days to the building of Solomon's temple. You remember the instructions that God gave clearly to them? That they were to go to the rock quarry and they were to cut out the rocks. But the rocks were to be cut to exact measurements. So that when they were brought to the temple, not a hammer nor chisel would be used, but they could be slid right into place. You remember that? I think we have a picture there of what's going on in this life. You see, God is making you exactly what He wants you to be, shaping you through that hardship, the difficulty, the adversity, because He's got a special place in eternity. He wants to use you. And He's preparing you so that when that day comes, you'll be able to be used. I'm convinced that's why some people in this life experience so much pain and agony and suffering and loss because God's getting them ready for a special service in eternity. Don't waste your sorrows. Don't turn bitter and angry toward God, but say, God, thank you, you're using, you're using this to prepare me for a greater glory to serve you in eternity. And then number six, God used adversity to bring us into unity as a body of Christ. Revelation 1.9, John says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Fellow partaker in the tribulation. You know what will bind people together faster than anything? common suffering. You know, there's a term that's used uh, for military service, people who serve together, band of brothers, right? And some of you have served in the military and you have been in dangerous situations with comrades and that has forged a bond that is strange and remarkable, but it is strong. Some people still get together with their military buddies 20, 40 years after they served together because of the bond that was forged through common suffering. When a body goes through suffering, it draws the body closer together. I've known of churches that have experienced some tragedy like a tornado destroyed the church or a fire destroyed the church. And so the church had to all pull together and they had to work together. And you know what it did to that church? Man, it brought them together, didn't it? So God uses adversity to build strength. It'll build strength in your family. When your family goes through adversity and difficulties, it's like glue. And at the time, you look at it and think, man, this is awful. But after you get through it, you can look back on it, sometimes you even laugh, but it was a gluing process, building you as a family. So you think about couples. When couples go through adversity together, it can strengthen them. Unfortunately, sometimes it divides them. But if they look to the Lord, it will strengthen them. So he uses unity, uh, suffering to bring unity. And then... Number seven, God uses adversity to bring us into a deeper walk with Him. 
Job went through his share of difficulties, didn't he? We all know. When it was all said and done, when you, can't, when you come down to the end, what was the final result? Here we have Job speaking. My ears had heard of you. He's talking to God. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. You know what Job was saying? He was saying, you know, I'd known about you, God, before all this, before this tremendous suffering and adversity and pain. But now, now through this, I know you. I know you personally. And I will tell you, you will never grow as quickly, as deeply in your spiritual life as when you're going through suffering and adversity. You remember Paul. Paul said his desire, he says, his desire that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. It's a package. We all want to know the power of the resurrection, don't we? Huh? We all want to know him, but we're not too keen on the fellowship of his sufferings. But it's in the fellowship of his sufferings that we come to know him and the power of his resurrection. It is in our weakness that His power is perfected. It's a package deal. And so God uses adversity to bring us into a deeper walk with Him which will result in Christ's likeness. So why do you have to go through what you're going through? Because it's tailor-made. God has tailor-made it for you because it's His best way to make you like Jesus. What should be our response then? How are we to respond to our adversity knowing what we know? First, we ought to rejoice in it. You know what we've read in James already twice today? Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Rejoice in it. You say, preacher, how in the world can I rejoice in it? You can rejoice in it because you know God in His wisdom has chosen this adversity for His best way to shape you into the image of Christ, which will bring Him glory. And that's why you're on this earth, to glorify Him. So rejoice in it. Secondly, we are to always give thanks. Ephesians 2.20 says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. How can you give thanks in this suffering? God, I know you and your wisdom have picked this for me. It wouldn't do for somebody else to have it, but it is your best for me. Having this boss, this un... un well, having this boss <laughs> is your best for me. Right? Having this spouse is your best for me. Watch it, preacher. You're getting too close to home now. Right? This is the situation. Having this teacher is your best for me to make me like Jesus. I thank you. I thank you. And then thirdly, we're to be content. We're to be content. Look at what Paul says. Paul was asking God to deliver him from the affliction that he had that was a, a debil debilitating affliction. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Paul said, because I realize that these adversities are tailor-made by God in His wisdom to make me like Jesus, that in my weakness Christ's power is perfected, I am going to boast in them. And I will be well content. Now that word in the Greek actually is well pleased. It was used when, when God the Father said of Jesus on the Mount of Trig Transfiguration, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. 
Paul says, well content. He said, I'm well pleased with them. Because in my weakness, in my extremity, in my suffering, the power of Jesus is made known in me. And I know Him. I draw close to Him as I do in no other place. So let's go back to the question we started with. Lord, why? I hope you can answer that question now. Will you receive this truth? Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our Minister of Community Connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.